liver metastases develop in up to 70 75% of patients with neuroendocrine cancer. And the five-year overall survival with untreated liver metastasis is reportedly 30%. Today, I will review the rationale for liver surgery for neuroendocrine metastasis, risks of liver surgery, and questions to ask your liver surgeon. First, the rationale. A 51-year-old gentleman presented with abdominal pain. He was diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor in the small bowel with liver metastasis. He underwent resection of the small bowel, the entire right liver, and parts of the left liver. Pathology showed eight liver metastases, and he remains free of disease after two years. The rationale for liver resection for neuroendocrine metastasis is to prolong survival. This is a survival curve of patients treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. On the y-axis is proportion of patients. On the x-axis is time. At time zero, everybody is alive. But as time goes on, the curve dips lower, reflecting patients dying of disease. In this survival curve, the top line represents patients undergoing liver surgery. The middle line, arterial embolization, which I will discuss later, and the bottom line, supportive care. Most surgical series of patients undergoing liver surgery for neuroendocrine metastasis report a five-year overall survival of about 75%. This is in contrast to the 30% I mentioned earlier without treatment. The disclosure is that we are comparing two distinct populations of patients. Those who underwent liver surgery were more likely younger with fewer and smaller tumors. Another rationale for liver surgery is symptoms. A 68-year-old gentleman presented with blood clot in his legs and a rash. He was diagnosed with a specific rash called necrolytic migratory erythema, which improved with intravenous amino acids. He underwent removal of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with persistent symptoms. He had a glucagonoma that had spread to the liver. After liver resection, his symptoms resolved. What about the risks of liver surgery? One risk is bleeding while dividing the liver because the liver has many small and large blood vessels. We at MD Anderson use a technique which we term the two-surgeon technique to divide the liver. The primary surgeon holds a dissecting instrument to dissect and expose small blood vessels and bile ducts. The secondary surgeon holds a coagulating instrument to coagulate and seal blood vessels. We have shown that this technique is associated with reduced blood loss. So the surgeon is dissecting the liver, and the assistant intermittently will come and coagulate small blood vessels. And you see there is very little blood loss. Another risk of liver surgery is bleeding from the vena cava that has many branches from the liver. Bleeding from the vena cava can be difficult to control because parts of the liver wrap around the vena cava, making it difficult to see. A 74-year-old gentleman presented with flushing and abdominal pain. He was diagnosed with a neuroendocrine metastasis in his right liver that was right next to the vena cava. The classic approach to removing right-sided tumors is to lift the liver off the vena cava and tie off any branches. The assistant is holding the liver up. This is a branch to the vena cava that is being dissected, and clips are being placed. And you can see that the visualization is challenging. An alternative approach is termed the liver hanging maneuver. 
Here we create a space behind the liver in front of the vena cava. The camera is zooming on the vena cava. The assistant is holding the liver away. And this metal catheter is being introduced behind the liver and in front of the vena cava. The catheter is passed behind the liver to the other side. A suture is placed in the holes in the metal catheter and then tied to a rubber drain. The rubber drain is then passed back behind the same space. and the rubber drain is used to hang the liver. This is the two surgeon technique used to divide the liver directly on top of the rubber drain. And the vena cava is exposed. Another risk of liver surgery and something to ask your liver surgeon is the risk of liver failure. The liver does regenerate, but you need a critical volume of liver to remain, something called the remnant liver volume. Nearly 20 years ago at MD Anderson, we showed that this critical remnant liver volume is 20%. On this graph, the y-axis shows complication rate. Patients with a remnant liver volume less than 20%, half of them had complications. In contrast with a remnant liver volume more than 20%, only 15% of patients had complications. We measure the remnant liver volume with CT scan and specialized software. And if the volume is less than 20%, we perform a procedure called portal vein embolization. An interventional radiologist blocks branches of the portal vein to the side of the liver with the tumors, which diverts blood to the other side, the remnant liver, which then grows. This is a patient with tumors in his right liver, and his remnant liver volume was small. This is a CT scan four weeks after portal vein embolization, showing significant growth in his remnant liver volume. Patients often ask me, what questions should I be asking? An important question is, what are less invasive alternative treatments? For the liver, they are arterial embolization and ablation. The liver has a dual blood supply from the portal vein and the hepatic artery. Tumors are preferentially fed by the artery. Embolization involves blocking the arterial blood flow to the tumor, and at the same time, chemotherapy or radiation can be injected. When embolization is combined with chemotherapy, this is called chemoembolization. Chemoembolization should be avoided if more than 75% of the liver is involved with tumors. And for patients who've had a prior Whipple procedure or a biliary stent, embolization should be performed with caution because of the risks of a liver abscess. This is a study comparing survival after liver resection or arterial embolization for neuroendocrine metastasis. As you can see, patients who underwent surgery, the blue line, had longer survival. Again, these are two distinct populations of patients, which biases the results. Another treatment option is ablation, which is the use of heat, either microwave or radio frequency, to treat the tumor. Cell death occurs at high temperatures. Ablation can be performed through the skin by the radiologist or at surgery. Limitations of ablation include heat injury to adjacent organs and structures, such as the stomach or the bile duct, size limit as it is not effective for larger tumors, and the number of tumors. For neuroendocrine cancer, the number of tumors is often a limitation to ablation because ablating many tumors is less likely to be successful. Intraoperative ablation is a useful adjunct to surgery. 
This patient has a large tumor in the right liver and a smaller tumor in the left. A good strategy is to resect the large tumor on the right and ablate the small tumor. We at MD Anderson reviewed our experience with over 200 liver resections for neuroendocrine metastasis. Patients who underwent resection plus ablation had the same survival as patients who underwent resection alone. Another question I'm often asked is, did you get it all? To answer this question, you need to know the surgical margin. The pathologist examines the distance between the edge of the tumor and the edge of what was removed. If there was tumor at the edge of what was removed, that is a positive margin. For most cancers, we want to achieve a negative margin. However, for neuroendocrine liver metastasis, that seems not to matter. In our experience at MD Anderson, patients who underwent liver resection with a negative margin had the same survival as patients who underwent resection with a microscopically positive margin. Another important question is, what is my recovery after liver surgery? This is a graph of complications after liver surgery at 35 different hospitals in the state of Maryland. They range from aspiration to sepsis to heart attack. The diamond represents the average complication rate, and the lines represent the variation between hospitals with low and high rates of complications. Another study classified surgeons and hospitals as low, intermediate, or, or high volume, depending upon the number of liver surgeries performed. As you would expect, surgeons and hospitals that performed more liver surgeries had fewer complications, fewer post-operative deaths, and were more likely to rescue a patient suffering from a serious complication. What about functional status? A study of patients aged 60 and older in San Antonio evaluated their functional independence after complex abdominal surgery. In this graph, the y-axis shows patient-reported scores of how independent they were in their activities of daily living, and on the x-axis is time after surgery. After liver surgery, there was an initial dip in functional status, but patients recovered their activities of daily living by six weeks. The bottom line is the Whipple procedure, which has a slower recovery. In conclusion, liver surgery is associated with improved survival and palliation of symptoms for metastatic neuroendocrine cancer. The risks of liver surgery can be minimized with advances in perioperative care, surgical technique, and measurement of the remnant liver volume. Ablation can be a useful adjunct to liver resection, and liver surgery should be performed in a high volume center. So the first question is, unknown primary liver metastasis, when is the right time to consider liver resection, at least for the larger lesions? Um, if, if, if technically feasible, and if it's grade one or two, so we, um, I didn't say this, but we don't generally operate in high-grade in high neuro, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Um, if it is technically feasible, we recommend surgery, and the primary tumor will most likely be in the small bowel. Um, Second question, primary neuroendocrine tumors located in the small bowel mesentery with liver metastasis, should I consider removal of small bowel or liver debulking? Again, if technically feasible, um, and again, grade one or two, you could combine the two surgeries, or if you're going to need a major liver resection, stage them. Um, and then the whole question of debulking, this is not, um, there's no consensus in the medical community. As I said, a microscopically positive margin for the liver, um, you have the same survival as a negative margin. There are some centers that advocate 90% debulking, others that advocate 70%. It's very institutional, depend, institu dependent on the institution, and we don't have a consensus on what percent you should be aiming to debulk. Um, here, we do a, a try to achieve a grossly negative resection. Is lesser invasive surgery okay to remove a lung neuroendocrine tumor? Yes, absolutely. So I think the question is, can you do a thoracoscopic 
surgery and do a wedge resection of the lung instead of doing a whole lobe of the lung and absolutely the less invasive surgery is better. What is the maximum amount of liver a person can lose and how long does it take to grow back? So um, if you have a normal liver, then you just need 20% uh, so you can remove 80%. If you've had a lot of chemotherapy or a fatty liver, then we recommend having at least 30% stay behind and it grows back very quickly, like in a month. In regards to liver volume, is it 20% 20 per, 20 per side or total liver? So the right, there's variation among all people. Not everybody's liver is shaped the same, but the right liver is uh, definitely bigger than the left liver in, in, in all people. Uh, in what parts of the liver are tumors inoperable, unable to reach, risk too high? Um, so as I was saying, one really tricky part about liver surgery is the uh, vena cava. There's a part of the liver called the caudate, which is sitting right on top of the vena cava. That's probably um, the trickiest part of the liver for us to operate on. And then the bile duct uh, is, is also a tricky area for us. Um, liver resection, would you do both sides at the same time or two surgeries doing one side at a, at a time? So if the volume is going to be sufficient, we can do both sides at the same time. If the volume is not sufficient, we, do the, we generally do the left side first. Then we um, measure the liver volume. If the volume is not enough, then we do portal vein embolization and do the right side at a second, second stage. And what is the hospitalization period for li liver embolization? What is the post-hospitalization recovery area, re recovery period? Um, at MD Anderson, for patients getting embolization, they're typically hospitalized overnight, and they um, go home the next day. Depending on the volume of liver that's embolized, you can have this, these, these flu-like symptoms, and they can linger for a week.